Hey, how's it going? Hey, how's it going, Paul? Good. Can you hear me okay? Um, yeah, I can hear you well, and I think the people should be able to hear you well. Great, great. Uh, Paul, thank you. First of all, thank you so much uh, for doing this. This is a great honor to me, and I, I know there are a lot of tennis enthusiasts out there that that appreciate that very much that you took your time. I know we you're very busy with Tennis Channel and all the projects you have. So thank you so much for taking your time for doing this. No, no, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, um, yeah, I saw you on one of the podcasts with my friend Joel. Uh, oh, sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was like, yep, yeah, let's, he said, just ask him. Very nice man. So that's what I did. And thank you again for doing this. So, Paul, as I ask every, everybody I had on the show, um, how did you start to play? A lot of a lot of players, the parents started them. So it's interesting always to hear how the dynamics were when you started. Well, same with me. Uh, my parents started uh, when I was a little kid, and they're school teachers, and uh, we didn't have a lot of extra money. So my brother and I would go to the park with them when they were playing tennis, and then my brother and I would play and. Uh, from there, it just seemed to be a little bit uh, something that I fell in love with. And um, my parents kind of got me some good coaching. And off I went. I went to Boletari's when I was 13 and a half. And then it was before it was the huge academy that it is now. There were a few people there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was a great experience for me. And I was there with some terrific players. Jimmy Arias was there um, when I was down there. And Carling Bassett. And, and uh, a, lo a lot of great players. Rodney Harmon, Pablo Wright. We had a lot of... Really good player. So I was at for four years, and then I went to University of Tennessee. And then uh, my professional journey started after that. So that was really it. My parents kind of skipped the babysitter and brought us to the park, and off I went. I, li I like that. And, um, you know, we didn't talk about this before. I, wanted, I want people to know. So I read your book, Coaching for Life. Oh, and, thank you. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, if you, if you love tennis and uh, you, you do a lot of things to – um, get better in things you do. So I, I like that. I like that book for many reasons. To get, give us a little bit of insight about Roger, about yourself, about uh, Tim Henman and the players who work with. So I really like that. And um, so in that book, what I found interesting when you mentioned you went to, to Bollettieri's. So when I was younger, um, I went to Nikki Pilic Tennis Academy in Munich. When right when Novak came, when Ernest Golbus came. So I was older, obviously. And uh, so I had a similar scenario like you did. So I wanted to mention it because I thought that was so funny because I went through it too. So I was two weeks in or three weeks in an academy and I wasn't used to work as hard as they did, right? So the morning run, five miles, uh, four hours of tennis, gym and everything. And, um, you know, I was very connected to my parents and I called my parents as well as you describe it in your book. So I called after three because I said, Dad, you need to get me out of here. <laughs> And, I'm <laughs> and I had the same experience. I, look, I couldn't sit at night. I was so sore. And then my, my mom said the same thing. She said, like, look, give it a month. Give it a month and a half. If you don't like it, I'll take you out. So I just wanted to mention that. That was so interesting. I, I really liked it. So was it? So you really yeah. wanted to go back home? Yeah, look, you, you, you remember the feeling well, right? It's a new environment, very <laughs> different. You're, as a kid, it's very easy to get uncomfortable because you're not used to it. And like <laughs> you said, you know, the discipline of that many hours a day, um, plus being away from home, just the discomfort of being out of your element. When you're a little kid, it's hard to manage it. But uh, both of our parents are right. It's, it's amazing when you hang in there a little bit, yeah. you know, human skills start to adjust, you know, you yeah. start to adapt, you start to learn to be comfortable. And all those things that you think or that I that that, that I thought was was very difficult turned out to be kind of character strengthening you know, the ability to deal with um, adversity. And a lot of the things I talk about in the book were kind of bred from being at Boletari's, learning to be comfortable being uncomfortable. That's mm -hmm. hard to do, right? Yes. Um, and I think that that's one of the problems that we all face when we teach and coach is that so many coaches teach and coach kids to try to be perfect players. You don't, I disagree with that. I, I, I think the philosophy of coaching and teaching is to teach and work kids really hard and really smart so that when adversity strikes, they can problem solve, they can adjust, they can react the right way. Because if they're striving for perfection, that's not going to happen. Yeah. And then I learned this 
um, actually after I stopped, unfortunately, when I started coaching Pete Sampras, he kind of helped me understand that um, because he would win a lot of matches and not play that well for him. Mm -hmm. And I remember as his coach talking to him about it and me wanting to figure out his mindset so that he could play better. And he very calmly said, look, he said, my biggest skill isn't that uh, all the physical talent I have. My biggest skill is that if I don't play that well and I stay calm and I manage my emotions and I think about what I want to do on the court, I'm still going to win 90% of my matches anyway. Yeah. So I, I just have to not expect perfection and just kind of manage what I have on the day. And it was really interesting. He was very young when he, when he told me this. And, and I thought that was very interesting because, you know, you, you strive to play great, but that's not going to happen very much. You have to strive to play smart and you have to strive to manage things great on the day, whatever it is. If your serve's off, you better be hitting your ground strokes well. Yeah. If your ground stroke's off, figure out a way to get to the net. And so much of tennis, I think, is such a great um, life lesson because you have to adjust. You have to adapt. And you know, look at the times we're in right now. It's no one, I've never seen this before. No one's ever seen it. Yeah. So you have to figure out how to make the new normal safe and livable. And um, on the tennis court, a lot of those things happen as well. So I think they're great life lessons. So that's a great point you're mentioning, you know, like teaching now 23 years for me. I, that's one of the biggest challenges we face as coaches. You know, a lot of the junior players, they think they have to play or they will play every match great. But as you said, out of 100 matches, how many? You might have five great matches where everything works well or 10. And then you have to find a way to, to make it happen on the court if you don't have a good day. So that's what I like as well about that coaching philosophy, you know, to, to find a way to make it work when you have those bad days. So and that, that stuck out to me a little bit. And then what I, what I liked as well when you said in the book, most meaningful part of your of your career was like obviously building champions, but more like developing, developing the development of a championship people, like of the, of the character of, you know, life lessons and, and getting people and coaching people who pass that on. So that was very impressive. That's one of your first sentences in the book. So that I like that. As yeah. Well, yeah. I think, you know, look, I think, you know, I think adversity and competition, kind of show you what kind of character you have, you know, how you deal with uh, competition and adversity and winning and losing. And, and one of the hardest things about tennis is it's individual, right? And, and so you walk on the center court at Wimbledon and there's no one but you out there. There's no other people on the football pitch with you. You know, there's no other people on the basketball court with you. It's up to you. So all of your traits and all your strengths and weaknesses are out there for everybody to see in a lot of ways you are emotionally naked out there trying to figure it out so unless you've been there it's really hard to comment on it but one of the things that i've been really amazed with and that i've seen is you know i've been very lucky the people i've been around are, have a lot of very good character traits you know pete in particular and roger and henman you know they they deal with winning and losing you know, with class, if they win, they're happy, but they understand they didn't just cure cancer. And if they lose, they're disappointed, but they understand that no one just died. I just lost a match. Let's move on. So it's that balance, that perspective of maintaining the drive to be competitive, being frustrated when you lose, but don't let it overwhelm you and being happy when you win, but understand that that's all it is. You just won the tennis match and the journey continues. You know, one of the biggest things I like to talk about with people that I coach is you have to realize, you know, your tennis career, if you're playing professionally, it's like, it's kind of like a bus stop that doesn't, it's a bus trip that never ends. There's no ending. There's mm -hmm. just stops along the way. It just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. And the only ending is when you hang your rackets up and you're done. Like so that. you have to have, I think, a pretty composed um, personality and a thoughtful mindset to get through all of these different emotions. And I think that those character traits that I mentioned in the book that, you know, really shine so well about Pete and Roger and, and, and Tim and, you know, you know, Sloan has it as well. And, and Taylor Fritz is 22 years of age. I'm helping him right now. Yeah. He's one of the most competitive people I've been around. Um, the losses really sting him really hard, but he does get past it pretty well. 
Um, so I think it's trying to find that balance for all the players. Um, and like I said, I think that, that those, those character traits help you with life as well. Yes. And then um, I have another question. So I talked to Craig O'Shaughnessy, who, who works uh, who worked with Novak. And um, so he said, you know, it was funny when I talked to him. He said, Novak always wants to know why and ask questions. That's what we want as coaches, right? We want the, the players to ask us why we teach them something, what we do. And I was reading that Federer does the same. He, and maybe you can uh, talk, talk a little bit about when, when you first started with him, I was laughing. Sure. And when he said like, yeah, so what, what we're going to do, Paul, tell me what, what to do now. You know, that, that was yeah. funny. So, yeah, that was the first time we were on the court together in Zurich. We went out and he warmed up for a little bit. And then he said, okay, what do you want me to do? And, uh, you know, and I said, is it that simple? I can just tell you what to do and we'll do it. And uh, we had known each other for a long time, so we were comfortable with each other. And he said, he said, no, I'm probably going to ask you why. He said, you know, when I was a little kid, all my friends and the coaches used to call me the why man, because when they said to do something, I would say, why? What's mm -hmm. the purpose? Mm -hmm. But the thing about Roger, which I found really interesting, is that as soon as you explain it to him and he understands how it plugs into his game, mm -hmm. he's like, okay, let's go do it. You know, he doesn't. He's very open and aware. And I think that that's, you know, to me, it's a very interesting character trait of great champions is they have to be so confident and so secure in their abilities, but they also have to understand that their abilities don't make them perfect and they don't make them infallible. You know, they're still vulnerable. There are still ways to get better. And you have to be open-minded to do that. You have to hear information and trust the information from the people around you to do it. And, and I got to say, Roger was amazing at it. And that's why he's still playing at, at almost 39 years of age is because he loves the journey. He loves to be out on a tennis court. Um, he's always trying to think of new ways to play better. He's always trying to think of ways to improve his skill set and understand, yeah, I play good tennis, but what can I do to make it fun, creative, and what can I do new and what can I do better that I'll enjoy doing? So it's tough because champions need to be stubborn, but they also need to be open-minded. Um, and, and I think that that is some of the trait, two of the really most important traits. So interesting that Novak is, is kind of the same way. And, and I think that, um, you know, I, I've heard, uh, I heard Emilio Sanchez told me this about Rafa as well. He was on the court with him during Davis cup during a, during a tie one time. And uh, Rafa just said, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> and Neil is like, and he was already a great champion. You know, this was yeah. in 2009. And I found that very interesting because, you know, if you trust the messaging and yeah. you trust what's coming at you and you plug it into your skill sets, it's really valuable. You know, I asked Pete at the S Sampras at the end of his career, um, you know, why, why do you think it's important for you to have a coach? You know, because you've done this for so long and you know, your game so well, and he said, because no matter what I no matter what I think and feel on the court, when I'm in the middle of a match, it's really hard to have a totally objective set of eyes that I trust, you know. <laughs> so to have that second set of eyes that knows the situation, knows my game so well, understand what's successful, can take the emotion out of the situation and then help me afterwards is really valuable. So I found that really interesting, and I think it's really true because no matter how good you are, when you immerse yourself in an environment, there's always some degree of an emotional attachment that could cloud the evaluation of what's happening. And I think that's why most great players really do like to have a trusted set of eyes around them to help be their true north. And what I mean by that is just to help balance things so that there's a good barometer for them. Yeah, and you've been, yeah, to I totally agree with it. I feel the same way. And you've been with him a long time, and you know it's hard to find people you you trust. That as you said, that's one of the most important things. L you know, looking at Ro Roger's team, um, the the guys are like he he picks that team. He trusts all the guys. Otherwise, it wouldn't work in that team. And and uh, and another thing in the book I like when you said he knows how to put each person into their role to benefit the most for him out of it. So that was very, very interesting as well, because I think that's very important if you have a team. And coming to the team, I see a lot of players, my friend Damir Zumur, for example, like the, a lot of players have physios with them. You know, like I know obviously Roger and Pete and 
and Novak and Rafa, they can afford mm -hmm. and they, they have their whole big team. But a lot of players who are like top 50, they're starting to have their own physios with them, their own people. What, what do you think about how, how much does that help, you know, in the process of going to the next step, maybe? Because well, I think, I think, you know, if you have the means, look, I always admire people that are willing to invest in themselves, you know, and, and I think that, um, you know, by investing in a coach and a physio or whatever you need, a, co mm -hmm. a coach and um, strength and conditioning coach and a physio, if you're willing to do that, to me, that shows that, you know, you, you really want to try to maximize your talent. Um, and I think the players at the top, especially understand how difficult physically it is on your body now and how much hard work it is day after day, week after week, flying around the world. So I think it's very valuable. Um, I think the tours um, do a pretty good job of supplying a physios at events, yeah. but then you're kind of at the mercy of everybody else who's in the draw as well. So if it's a 32 draw at a challenger um, and you have a bunch of people waiting around to get treated, you can't have it when you need it. But I think a physio that understands your body is extremely important. Um, Taylor Fritz has a physio named Wolfgang Oswald, who's incredible. I mean, he is he knows the, the body incredibly well, knows Taylor's body incredibly well. And when he's not around and Taylor says something's wrong, I always ask, I will call Wolf and I'll say, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. And he'll tell me whether it's something to worry about or not. Okay. And, and so the the role that they play is really invaluable because the game is so physical now. Um, and you're seeing more of that for more players, like you mentioned, in the top 50. Um, and, and I think the top guys really and the top ladies know really how important it is. Yes, oh, definitely. Um, so talking about Roger, Pete, Henman, Taylor, Sloan. So when, when you – like, let's talk about, like, Sempras and Federer. So those those two guys – like when you start working with them, like you know, a lot. I got a lot of questions. What, what, how, how? What do you do on court with them? Like, is it you know? People always think it's a magic formula, but like, w like, do they hit like regular people? Like, sure. you know, two on ones. Sure. Um, so yeah, that's they... the thing. Yeah, that that's the thing. You know, that I, mean, I think the great players, the ones that I've been around, realize there isn't a magic formula. You, you know, they tick all the professional professionalism boxes, you know, mm -hmm. the preseason, you know, Roger was very systematic about it. You know, his, his strength and conditioning coach, Pierre Paganini, I think is a genius. I think he's amazing. And, and Pierre would coordinate with me um, kind of what, how the train, if we had four weeks, what they looked like, mm -hmm. you know, he would take the first two weeks uh, with Roger and just do strength and conditioning stuff to build up the body to make sure it's ready to go. Mm -hmm. Then, you know, the next week we would incorporate tennis and strength and conditioning together, do things so that I was helping him and he was helping me, Pierre and I worked together. And then the last week, the majority of it was just tennis and the strength and conditioning would kind of taper off and then the physio gets more involved. So there's a there's there's kind of a segmented process that you go through, and I think the great players know um, their bodies and understand what's successful. I think everybody's a little different, and you have to figure out how to manage that. Um, but I, I really love that Roger was so clear about what he needed to do and the way mm -hmm. he needed to do it. Um, I think Pete was very clear about it as well. So was Tim. Um, I think Sloan now as she's in her mid twenties is starting to realize how she needs to do it better. Uh, one of the biggest challenges right now is that it's been so long, right? And, and yeah. the players have not played and, and it's very difficult to um, give a pro player in particular, a work schedule in terms of training if they don't know when the starting date is. Mm -hmm. And so now we hope that the beginning or second week in August, things will start up again. So once I knew that, I then created a schedule with David Nankin, who's Taylor Fritz's co-coach, um, and the strength and conditioning folks as well, um, Brent Salazar and Amoy Caesar, and then Wolf, um, the physio, all, you know, we would kind of talk about what we needed and then you kind of put a schedule in place and then try to let it play out. Wow, nice. 
All right, coming a little bit back to you. So your yes, brother. Yes, let's talk about me. Your your brother <laughs> coached you. Yes, yeah. your brother coached you for a while. So how how you know you always hear you know when parents coach the players might go wrong, might be well, right? You hear a lot maybe negative things about that because it's a lot of emotions in there. How is the dynamic when the brother coaches a player? So I wanted to ask you that. I got that actually three, four times asked. Um, I was lucky. My brother, you know, was and is one of my best friends. You know, I mean, he he was my um, stabilizing force when I was on the road. And um, he knew my game incredibly well, knew tennis incredibly well. So I totally trusted him. And, and because he knew my personality, I think I was lucky because, you know, one of the hardest things as a coach, I think, is to be able to understand why players do things. And in order to do that, you have to understand their personality. You have to Good understand empathy. what's happen happening and be empathetic to who they are. I was re here's a great story. I was rewatching the um, the um, 2000 Wimbledon finals when Sampras was playing Rafter a couple of days ago on mm -hmm. Tennis Channel. And I was rewatching it and, re and I remember it very well. And I noticed it at uh, Pete was down a set and then 4 1 in the tie break in the second set. Actually, I watched, uh, that. I watched that one too. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he won five points in a row um, to get up 6 4, lost a point. And then at 6 5, he served and he hit a kick serve first at the body. Mm -hmm. And I didn't remember that. And. <laughs> And uh, so I sent him a text, you know, I told him, I, was, I sent him a text and I said, I forgot that you hit a kick serve first. Why did you go kick serve first at six, five in the tie break? He's one of the biggest and best first serves ever. He goes, cause I was nervous exclamation point, <laughs> which is, in, which is interesting, right? Yes. It just shows you everybody gets nervous. Everyone's human, you know, and then he fit, you know, his kick serve is pretty heavy. Yeah. So he figured I go heavy kick serve at the body worst case scenario i'm going to get a volley anyway but i don't have to hit a second serve and as big as he was i mean i don't think he lost his serve that match anyway but i just found it very interesting but people forget no matter how good you are how ner everyone gets nervous so mm -hmm. you have to understand why these players make decisions and and pete was always very honest about that stuff with me so when i had my brother with me traveling he knew me really well so he could figure out why things happen and yeah. i think as a coach one of the one of the things that we miss sometimes is listening to the players yes, to understand much. why they do things right yes. and and some are easier than others taylor you know will taylor's unbelievably stubborn which is really good sometimes in matches mm -hmm. most of the time almost all the time in matches but very challenging sometimes when david nank and i are trying to teach him something mm -hmm. because he's really stubborn mm -hmm. so you better be able to try to convince him with it but those are the scenarios that as a coach, you have to figure out how the player works yeah. to help them understand, right? That, and so I was really lucky because my brother understood me really well. That's a, that's a good point, as I said, like, you know, empathy and knowing why we coaches, too often we see a player doing something and then we just, you know, maybe shout or like get angry, but a lot of coaches might struggling in getting to know the player a little bit better and that's where you get the most out of it. When I have Brian, Brian Boland at one of my tennis conferences I was organizing, Brian said too, I started to have success as a college coach was when I started to show really empathy and get to know my players really, really well. So I understood more things, what I was, you know, doing um, with them. And they, yeah, you, they ha you were... have to, right? You have to, right? Because it's very easy to just yell and scream yeah. and, and just say, just do this. Yeah. You know, it's easy to say just, well, there isn't a just do this. You know, it, there's so many things that come into play. On a practice court, I think you can feel, you can be, as a coach, you can be more dictatorial. Yeah. You can say, we're just going to do this today. And if they push back, you have to explain why, yeah. you know, and there's, there are times where it gets difficult. You know, there's oftentimes with Taylor where he'll say, I don't really want to do this. This is a gimmick. It's not realistic. And I'll go, yeah, it's not realistic to a match, but this is why you need to do it. This is he, this is how it will help you when you're playing. You know, if you do certain things that you make them hit eight balls before you start a drill, it builds mm -hmm. up rally tolerance, right? It makes them learn to be patient before being offensive. You know, there's reasons behind. I think in, ma in, in matches, 
you have to be much more empathetic about evaluation because yeah. of the emotion, because of the pressure, um, because of all the other things, self-imposed and otherwise by the players. But yeah, I, I just think the best coaches are the ones that are empathetic and the ones that can listen as well as give information. I agree. And then what, what about the university years? Uh, the University of Tennessee, I think you read, you went three years, you did? Three years? Yeah. Ago? So, you know, I had like Alexander Vasquez who went to San Diego State. He's a good friend of mine. He was at the uh, university. A lot of players uh, right now, Dominic Kupfer, he was like, we were based in New Orleans. He went to Tulane here. He's a top 100 player now. How much did the, the college help you to, to groom your, your game um, to become professional? And well, what do you I, think in our days, how, how well are the colleges like structured? I, I'm... Uh, Andy Brandy is one of my mentors. He the, he's at LSU at the moment, so I learn a lot from him there. And it's uh -huh. interesting to see if you have so many universities have just a great staff now where you can take that as a stepping board to become professional, I think. Right. Um, I, I, think, I think everybody's a little bit different. Um, and I think part of your own journey is figuring out who you are, who you are, um, and what works for you. And some people forget about college. Everybody isn't ready to turn pro when they're 17, 18. You know, everyone's, if I didn't go to college for three years, I wouldn't have been ready to turn pro. You know, my college coach, um, Mike DePalmer Sr., um, was one of my best friends. I, uh, he passed away this January, um, which was heartbreaking to me and so many people. Um, but he, if he wasn't around for my college years, I'm not sure I ever would have been a pro tennis player. I needed that maturation. I needed three years of guidance to be ready to play on the pro tour. You, you learn by example. I'll give you a good, I'll give you a good uh, uh, anecdote. When I, after my goal was to go to college for two years and turn pro. Okay. Mm -hmm. After my second year of college, I was ranked number two in, in collegiate tennis. And I was like, okay, I'm going to turn pro after the summer. And so I went out to play pro tournaments during the summer. During the summer, I lost seven weeks in a row in the last round of qualifying of tour events. And I was emotionally crushed. I was like, how, I mean, I'm, you know, I got nervous. Mm -hmm. Am I ready? Am I not good enough? And this is where I needed Coach De Palmer to say, so come back to school. Come back. If you, if you don't feel like you're ready, come back to school. Take the fall off. Go play some matches on the tour and then come back and play college tennis in January. Mm -hmm. And just by virtue of him explaining that to me, I took the fall off. My next tournament after those seven last round qualities in a row, I qualified actually in Basel, Switzerland. Oh, okay. the Basel, in Basel, I qualified and I got to the quarterfinals before I lost uh, to Vitas Gerolaitis. And so that just freed me up. But my point is, you need to know how to deal with adversity. You need to manage yourself, understand when you're ready and when you're not. And I think too many people, what I've found, I've done some work with um, the LTA. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked in England for four years and also um, have been working with Tennis Australia for um, four or five years as well. And I've spent some time running player development for the USDA. So I, I understand the kind of trajectory of how it works. And I think too many people, especially outside the U.S., look at going to college as a failure. I look at college as a success and as a trampoline. Yeah, yeah, an opportunity. What The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to get a good education. Huh. You're going to mature as a person. You're yeah. going to become a better <laughs> tennis player, and you're going to learn to deal with life. If you're going to be a pro tennis player, you're not going to not be a pro tennis player if you go to college. That, yeah. That's how I look at it. Oh, same and, here. And, you know, so I, I just think you look at the resources of universities, and for me, it's really – it was so valuable. And, and I would – implore any young players that want to go uh, and play pro tennis that aren't the superstars to don't worry about going to college, find a good university, find a good coach with good resources, get better, uh, get some education, become a more mature person. And I can promise you, if you're going to be a pro tennis player, there's no way that college is going to hinder that. Oh yeah, and you pick as you said. You picked a, a good school. I I can just talk about LSU because Andy Brandy is there, and then you know Mark Kovacs is was there regularly. You know, and Alistair McCall. Like I mean, that's great guys to work with the with the kids there. And uh, and I just you know I just wished I would have gone when I was younger now. But I didn't I didn't want to leave my family because from Europe right. Germany you know it's far away. So I was more 
I needed someone like Nick probably to to kick my butt and like <laughs> and and get me over there. No, it's but tough. now it's nice to see. You know, when you come from Europe, you you haven't played. Uh, it's nice to see the dynamics, the the team, the team atmosphere. I think that's a big part. A lot of players say that they like that. And the biggest thing is, if you want to and you want to put the work in, they will let you and they will help you. So you know, but unfortunately, there are not a lot of guys that really, really, really want to let it all out there. And they think without hard work, they can become pros. That that doesn't work. As you as exactly, you know. exactly, very different times. Let, let me see. I have like two more. I got asked. One was, oh, since Pete was known for quality of second serve, speed and spin, was there another quality that Pete had besides the serve that separated him from his opponents? I I think Pete might be the most singularly kind of laser focused person I've been around, even though he's got a really quiet personality. um, He really understood from a young age what he was trying to accomplish from tennis. And most importantly, he was really secure about his pathway. In other words, even when he lost he didn't lose confidence. He didn't question the way he was doing things. Um, he was very clear and very comfortable about what he thought he needed to do. And, and to me, his mind is a much uh, a much underrated asset. And, and if you look at back at his career, um, a good example of it is how his his kind of winning percentage in the biggest matches. Oh, yeah. You know, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, he's uh, I think he's maybe fourteen of eighteen, 18 in finals yeah. of majors. Yeah. I just like saw that, that on so, tennis channel. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> so so um, if there's a huge match at hand, um, there's not a lot of guys I would rather have playing for it than Pete. He's gonna um, take so, it. Yeah, so his his mind his mind was very streamlined and simplified, but also laser focused, and he understood that. Um, I, I think. I think he is someone, whereas Roger is someone that that's laser focused, but also because he's such a gregarious person and loves life and <laughs> loves living life, he goes about things very differently. His family's with him on the tour and he goes to museums and they do a lot of wonderful <laughs> things from a human point of view that there's no chance Pete would have ever done when he mm-hmm. played. Wouldn't yeah. allowed him to play his best tennis. So That's so interesting to hear. Yeah, you never get yeah. those insights. That's why I wanted to thank you so much because those insights we never get as as, you know, coaches, players, and that's so so nice that uh, that that you do those love those. Yeah, spots. I think but I think but I think as a coach, whether it's Pete or Roger or two 18-year-old kids, part part of what you're trying to figure out as a coach is the dynamics of the player's personality, you know, and then when you have, you understand that, then you should be able to use your skills. You're the coach to figure out how to press the right buttons, depending on what the player's personality is. You know, that's why, I mean, as a coach, I just think it's so important to um, have an open mind. And as a coach, it's a better skill set to listen than to just talk. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. Then I got asked, Paul, I got asked by a student, I have to take that one question as one of my students, and I mean, like, he's, he knows everything about Roger, so, like, everything, like, unbelievable, he's a 14-year-old kid, he loves Roger mm-hmm. so much, and he was asking me if I could ask you one question, I said, all right, I'm going to do it this time, because he loves Roger so much, so he asked about Roger's, like, pre-match routines, how to get his mind 100% to the coming upcoming match, like the hour before or something, you know, like what, how is Roger focusing? Some players listening to music, you know, I heard that a lot. Some players watch TV, some, it's all, they're all different. Is this Roger doing anything in particular? He, 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 well, he has his routines. I mean, you know, he, ge- he generally does, um, you know, when I was with him, we usually the night before would have a, you know, a brief talk, five, five minutes to 10 minutes about what tomorrow's match looked like, you mm-hmm. know, just strategy wise, just so he had, just to make sure we were on the same page. Um, and, you know, and then, you know, and then the day of the match, we do his, you know, he'd wake up, he'd do his treatment, then he'd do his warm up um, on the court, hitting some balls. And usually between warm up um, and when he played, 
after the warm up, he'll have his meal. And then usually between warm up and when he plays, we kind of go over again what he talked about or what we talked about the night before for the match. Okay. If there's something really specific, for instance, if he's playing a lefty for the first time at the tournament, mm -hmm. then maybe during the warm up that day, we would work on just a couple different things just because of the lefty serve yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But generally, he had a very, really, really good understanding of the difference between warm up and practice. And this is one thing that I would implore coaches to teach young players is the day of matches when you're going to play a match, your work is done. Your work is done. Yeah. You're going to warm your body up to play a match. You're not going to get any better. You're not going to get any worse. The only way you'll get better or worse is if your mind tells you you're going to get better or worse. Yeah. But the, and that's one thing I really admired about Roger. Pete was the same way. They understood the difference between practice and warm up. And warm up, you just want to feel the ball. You want to feel comfortable, get the body going. Like I said, if it's a different style of play, maybe you'll practice it against the lefty return of serve a little bit. But understanding the difference releases a pressure valve internally, which helps. But Roger's routine was generally very similar to that, which was have a hit, go through a couple little simple themes, and then after the hit, we would readdress what he wanted to try to do during the match. So five minutes a night before, um, go through a strategy, half an hour hit, you know, a meal a couple hours before he plays, and then a, just kind of a reaffirmation of what he wanted to try to do on the court. But And then right before he goes on the court, he does his, um, you know, probably – you know, 15 to 30 minutes with the physio to get ready. And then another 15 to 30 minutes of warm up stuff to get his body going right before he goes on the court. Okay. All right. Before we, I take one or two from here, the last one here is about feedback. So, you know, every player reacts differently and wants feedback at a different time, I guess, you know, every person is different, as you said. And in junior years, you know, what I see too often, what I really do not like, that a lot of coaches give the feedback too early, but the worst is the parents. When, you know, you, let's say you drive four hours with your kid to a tournament, and then parents, you know, the kid just lost, like, I don't know, 16, 14 in a third set tiebreaker, played eight hours, right, and he's crying, <laughs> he's 13 years old, you know, and then they go in the car, drive back home, and dad locks or mom locks the door, and you we call it, I think Jorge Capistani said, backseat prisoner. So, so you're in the backseat, <laughs> you're a backseat prisoner, and then your dad or mom tells you, man, uh, the fifth point in the second set, you should have hit a drop shot, you know? And then, I, I mean, like, you know, having one of the most established coaches out there ever, <laughs> uh, can, you, can you say something about, you know, the, the feedback part and if it's sure. like maybe not yeah. the best idea? Um, yeah, no, I, I, look, again, again, a lot of it's we're, when you're talking about pro players, they're generally adults, so they've been through a yeah, lot more. Yeah. Um, but again, it's about reading their personality. Um, I, I'm a big believer on, again, understanding the player. Um, Roger was really good about taking the emotion out of winning and losing. Yeah. You know, he, he could hear things afterwards in a very calm manner. Pete was the same way. You know, if he was lost, he's disappointed, but he's very easy to sit down and talk to about, you know, what happened and what were you thinking here and, you know, what's a, you know, you can talk about it. Taylor's 22, Fritz, so he's a little more emotional right mm -hmm. now still. When he loses, he's very disappointed sometime. and frustrated. So you want to give him a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. um, but for juniors, as you mentioned, I, I think the most important thing for juniors is to make sure that they always get positive reinforcement first. Yeah. I mean, the biggest thing is that you have to make sure that you find a few good things to really hold on to first. And, and you kind of ease the pain of the defeat because it's, I think it's much harder as a kid. Um, and I think if they can find positive stuff and positive reinforcement, it's then much easier to go through things where perhaps they weren't so successful. And, and and as a parent, look, I have I have a parent. I've got three kids, and and I know it's difficult to detach from the emotional part of it. That's why it's really important, I think, for parents to let the coaches also um, help the parents manage the situation. That doesn't mean the parents don't have an input. Yeah. That means the parents have an input, 
and understand the best process is whatever the coach and the parent can decide, which is let's give Johnny a nice pat on the back. Tough day. That last tiebreaker was really difficult. Sam played really well. Boy, you fought hard. I'm really <laughs> proud of you. You did a great job. You know, and then you go get him an ice cream cone or a meal and you talk about school and life. And then later that night when it's starting to dissipate and there's less pain or the next morning, that's when you can then go through, you know, I was looking, you know, boy, you tried 12 drop shots and, and did the coach <laughs> think that that was the right thing to, you know, yeah. the, after Asking all them of questions that stuff and, has yeah. gone through and, and you let them become part of the conversation um, instead of being uh, more critical and putting your foot down at a time where maybe they're going through some pain themselves. I totally agree. I see my friend Oliver Morach, who won one of Australian Open and doubles. He's on there. So yeah. well, well said. He's a he's a very great family man as well, and uh, and, uh, so and yeah, a great I, player. Yeah, great player and great <laughs> guy as well. So let's do one more, if it's okay with you. Um, sure. Let's. So Scott Ergert asked, "When I watch Federer play, he seems so perfect and plays effortless. But as his coach, did you teach Federer anything new or fix a weakness?" So well. Well, well, look, I, look, I think, you know, the thing that I admire most about Roger and also, uh, you know, Sampras was like this too, no matter how good they are, they're trying to get better. Mm -hmm. You know, at that stage in their careers, Roger's game is pretty well put together, but our conversations are, how are you going to make it more effective? What can you do better to make it more effective? And you see, look, just a few years ago, he went to a bigger racket head, right? Yeah. A few years ago. And then he started getting even more aggressive off the backhand side, yeah. trying to take the ball earlier. Yeah. So Roger's always trying to improve. His general strategy and style of play is there, but he's always trying to get better at it. Um, one of the things people don't realize, and, and Pete was like this too, to a different kind of degree, but because they make it look easy, people don't think they work hard or it comes too easy for them. Yeah. But uh, I can tell you, they work extremely hard and, and very specific to the needs of their own game. They yeah. so understand their own game that they know it's not going to do Roger a lot of good to stay back 12 feet behind the baseline and hit cross court four forehands for 45 minutes. Or something. Against Rafa that, on clay court. Yeah, that's really <laughs> not going to be. Yeah, that's not his game. It's not going to. Yeah. That doesn't mean he can't. He doesn't need to get solid at the back of the court, but it doesn't do him any good to back way up and do ground stroke drills where he's 12 feet behind the baseline going side to side for an hour and a half. That yeah. doesn't serve a purpose. Yeah. Um, but I, so that's a very long winded answer, but the answer is the game is set up. You're trying to improve on the strategies and maybe tweak some techniques during the off season when there's a time where you have a little bit of time to discuss and tweak things. Um, and, and basically as you're doing that, you're also trying to reinforce confidence and, explain to the players why these new things are actually going to make them more effective and efficient as they move forward. Um, what else do we have? That's, I think we've been through all those. Well, Paul, like, as I said, Oh, one more thing. Well, okay. My, I know my mom is gonna watch it. She's almost eighty soon. Like, oh. like, like no, 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 like a little bit still. But she, she, she loved Sampras. So I just want to tell you, my. I had a match, and my mom's like, "No, I have to watch Sampras." I just wanted to say that on camera. My mom, my mom was the craziest Sampras fan. She watched every single <laughs> match she had, and and she That's didn't. Great. Man, like I, I had, to, I had to let let uh, that out. Yeah, and then uh, oh, last question, the person, like, what did you learn from? From Roger and from Pete, on, on a on a like, what what did you take out of those years working with them? Maybe on on a tennis level and then on a personal level as well. What? Um, I, I a few things I think, and I talk about this in the book is 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 that um, you know don't ever judge or estimate what extra special people can do as if they're normal people. Mm -hmm. In other words. Before Pete won 2002 U.S. Open, he hadn't won a tournament in 25 months. Mm -hmm. And people say, no, he can't win again. He's not going to yeah, win. He's slower. Them. He's older. He's blah, blah, blah. He's ranked 17 in the world. And, you know, I, I talked to my wife about this after he lost to George Bastel at Wimbledon because mm -hmm. I had spoken to Pete. And, and, and 
you know, in a way that I basically he, he's going to win another Wimbledon if you want to. But there's just a few things he had to work on. And my wife, who's not a tennis person, said, do you really think he's going to win? Everyone's saying he can't win. I'm like, he can win. And he's going to win if he wants to, because he's Pete. He's different, you know, and it's the same with it's the same with Roger at 38 years of age. Should he still be three in the world at 37? Should he get to the finals of Wimbledon and have match points on Novak still? Should you you know, that's not normal. So I've learned that you really can't judge extra special people as normal. They're different. You know, they do things differently. And 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 the life stuff I learned from um, from them is really the ability to handle and manage expectation and and not let the consequences of any one result change the character of who you are and how you go through life. And I, and I think that the great players use that to their strength. That's why they're able to deal with winning and losing. And you know as well as I do, every week on tour, everyone leaves the tournament mad except one person yeah. in singles. Yeah. So there's yeah. not very good odds. And, right? and, the, and most of them have in one year the top 50 players have two great tournaments and the rest is second first round that's how it is so you you have to be able to deal yeah. with the balance yeah and l- let's and think about it with the great players when do they make news generally they only make news when they lose because they're yeah. supposed to win yeah. so they're oh you have to be able to have a balanced reaction and both pete and roger were and tim henman was like this too amazing about dealing with the consequences of winning and losing without letting it indent the, the uh, confidence in themselves and more importantly, have any impact on the character of the kind of people they are. Character people they are and keeping them on track of the big picture where they want yep. to be. That's what you were talking about in the book, what I really liked exactly. having big goals and those small goals they are, that have to be obtainable. Otherwise, you know, they, they are not good. Well, exactly. Paul, I, I can't thank you enough that you took your time and especially. That was nice to chat. No, it was really like you're you're an amazing uh, person, and you know, like so many of the guys that you know, Emilio is a good friend of mine, Arancha, and then so many players I didn't know before. Like you know, you guys don't have to do that, but you love the sport so much that day in and day out, you know, like you you, you live and love tennis. So a big thank you from from my part and uh, i hope to meet you maybe one day uh, in life and i wish you all the best